This is Matt, everybody, who makes a lot of videos with us. <laughs> we got it. Our old friend. My name is Matt Whitecross. Uh, I'm a director. I have known the band. I've known Coldplay for many years now. But we went to uni together in London. I think we met in about 1998. They weren't even a band then. We just we were we were friends. And I I was desperate to be a film director, and they were all desperate to be in bands, but they were still kind of figuring it out. They, obviously, they went stratospheric immediately and it was and it was an amazing thing to see and go witness and be, be around and be part of and they're very inclusive they always used to invite everyone from uni who was a mate to every gig even as they became bigger and bigger and bigger and they always would always go oh yeah we, you know in the future once you've kind of come up a level we'll do stuff together and I was like yeah of course you will but they were always true to their word and we kind of carried on working so we've known each other for a really long time. When we, when we started shooting just as, as mates back at uni, we were filming anything and everything. So I just happened to have, my dad had a camera, so I took it to uni with me and I'd film anything that was happening. I only had about four tapes and they're really expensive. So I basically ended up having to kind of go, oh, well, that was a good night, but it wasn't that good. And then I have to film another gig the next night. Then Phil and Chris would always just ring and say, look, we're doing something tomorrow. Why don't you pop in? We're in the studio for the first time. That's exciting. Why didn't you? And we'd do kind of mini music videos and stuff, all of which were pretty bad, but it was more just to, to, to film something. And so I was in London, just around, and I remember hanging out with them, and I was like, well, why don't we make a film with this footage? And oh, no, no, we're, oh, we're boring, we don't want to, we don't want it to be about the music, we don't want to uh, talk about ourselves. I think Chris's mind was split 50-50 between, yeah, it's the right time, because we've kind of come to the end of a certain part of our journey, or whatever have you, you want to describe it, and another half and go, I never want any of this footage to come out. And I think the turning point really was that Phil said, well, why don't you send a bit of that early archive, see what the band thinks, see if they think it's too excruciating for words or whether they enjoy it. And I sent, I thought, I'll send a few clips. And then he said, the weirdest thing happened. I was sitting there watching on my laptop and Chris walked past and he said, what's this? And he got really into it and was really into the idea of, of doing a film. So that's, that's why it happened now. Let's do a thing. Okay, 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 okay. It's a, it's a funny thing because you look back on each stage of it and it all feels very natural and how it happened to them. I think even overnight success takes a while. You know, they really grafted at it. It was lovely to kind of see the rite of passage of how you go from playing, you know, tiny, shitty, dingy gig to suddenly going, oh, right, now you've met Michael Evers. I went to Glastonbury with a bunch of mates. We turned up, we knew they were playing in the, uh, the tent. So we ended up filming ourselves for a bit because it was getting later and later and it was getting closer and closer to a, to when they were supposed to be on. I think it even passed, say they were on at four in the afternoon, it was probably about quarter past four by the time they got there. But it was, you know, it's a kind of, it's a four in the afternoon thing and people didn't know who they were. So it wasn't, I don't think anyone kind of felt like things were changing, but it definitely, for me, it was more just kind of going, oh right, okay, hang on, this is, there are people here who know the songs and they're not, I'd, I've never met them before. Whereas in the past, it, you knew everyone at a gig. I played Glastonbury the first time in 1999, one of the first bands on. We had trouble getting onto the festival site 
and when we did eventually get onto the festival site, we were on the totally the opposite side of the site. We just grabbed our guitar and our amp each, traversed the entire site. I really wasn't very <laughs> faithful at the time. I was dying. <laughs> oh, we're pretty napping, I'm sorry about that. We had to jog across the whole site, which not all the bands do. We're one of the fittest bands in uh, South <laughs> We had a lot of footage, and it took, I think we had over a thousand hours of footage. And it was one of those things where you kind of figured out if we sit down and watch every single frame, we'll still be here in five years' time. You know, Phil and Chris tend to be the ones who are directing it, and they, I think from their point of view, they were like, is it enough? You know, there's no, we, didn't, we don't hate each other. <laughs> is that a problem? <laughs> Most bands hate each other when, after 20 years. But I thought it wasn't really about the bad times. It was really about, in the same way that you have with a marriage or something like that, it's like, how do you get through it and get out the other side? You know, it's all to do with the, the highs and lows and the compromises and the figuring out together. And it's, you know what's funny, sometimes I wake up and there's music and I have this conversation with stuff like, I, I really should probably sleep. And the other side of me is like, well, yeah, but if you didn't listen to the music they got sent, you wouldn't be in this house and you wouldn't be in the band. So you better just get up and do the music. Even if it's something that I think is completely ridiculous. Wouldn't it be great to do also to ask Rick if he has that uh, patch that will make the loop with the, mm. the string thing? Go. Yeah. I really love bringing something in and seeing what Johnny, Will and Guy do with it because they always surprise the thing and make the song better. Or recently also, sometimes they improvise and then bring me stuff, which is equally fun. I remember the first time I went, they ever played Wembley, I followed them out on stage and obviously didn't think about putting in the ear protection, they just said, I'll just turn up. So I was there filming them and then I'm backstage and obviously the natural progression is you're then walking out on stage and just the, the wash of sound, like the energy of it, you don't even feel it in your ears, you can't hear anything. You just feel it in your heart. You can feel like <laughs> something's happening. So it's really quite an amazing thing. I don't think that's, that's gone away at all. Like the Head Full of Dreams feels like it's kind of the biggest, but in the, in the best way, the most inclusive, most explosive, most kind of loved up thing that they've, they've done. It's, it's a very unusual thing to have been there from the beginning. And I think most people who end up becoming famous or in the public eye or whatever, they tend to have a kind of before and after in terms of the people who are around them. And this band, I don't know whether it's unique or not, but they have somehow kept this group of friends around them who were there from before any of them had picked up a guitar together. So I did definitely had a moment of thinking, I had to make this film in some way. It's been the most incredible privilege just to be there as an eyewitness and just to be a kind of fly on the wall in all these moments. And when the editors started showing me stuff, I was like, oh, this is great, who shot this? They're like, this is that's you, <laughs> you idiot. You know, you've, this is all your old footage. I'd forgotten a lot of it. And when you juxtapose that with the footage from now, to see how young they were back then, we were just babies. They were like tiny little kids, really. And they'd never experienced anything. So it's quite amazing to see the journey they've been on. They've hit the nail on the head of what they've always been trying to achieve. And that was quite an amazing thing to witness. for the ages. What did we do, future viewers of the universe? <laughs> what did we do? Did we do one standard amazing album? Did we do one deluxe that was actually standard and then make a slightly less good version? Did the album format die out altogether? Only you know. We're long gone, except Rick is 106 and happier than ever. Good night. <laughs>